Good morning, everyone. Let's worship God together. In the midst of meaninglessness, you call us to meaning, O oh God. Out of our brokenness, you call us to wholeness and new life in the spirit. In praise and thanksgiving, let us worship God. Our hymn of adoration today is we bless the name of Christ the Lord, number 214. Let us pray. We offer to you our words, O oh God, those tiny chips of meaning we spread abroad so easily and often so thoughtlessly. Keep us ever attentive to the impact of our words, particularly the ways that can cause pain or foster insecurity. Make our speech a force that does not destroy, but rather builds up so even our voices of protest may serve the greater cause of reconciling the human race to you. We thank you, O oh God, within and beyond us, for linking our lives in so many ways, making a chain of hope and compassion long enough and strong enough to circle the globe. When we walk hand in hand, when we, walk, when we work side by side, the impossible becomes the next challenge before us. And we know we can do what we dared not attempt. Many mountains of misery melt with you, your word of concern that we put into action and may there never again be despair or denial of your saving grace. We pray in Christ's name who taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm for today is Psalm 116, verses 1 to 2 and 5 to 9. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. 
our God is merciful. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. You may please be seated. Oh, we got to greet. I'm sorry, I missed a step. Hello. Sorry about that. Hello out there in YouTube land. Okay, now you may please be seated. Thank you, Mike. Okay, our announcements for today. Our rummage sale part two will be Friday and Saturday, September's 24th and 25th from nine to one. There's flyers on the table out there. If you can take some or one or two to hang somewhere to let people know we're having this sale, it would be greatly appreciated. We continue to take our offerings at the top of the stairs. Um, and we're asking that everyone place their offerings in, in the plate. Our missions, the Heifer Water Project, $390 has raised of our $750 goal. We also have an ongoing mission of collecting for the town's food pantry at St. Mary of the Bay. Are there any other announcements or prayer concerns? I know Jeff has one to make for the property committee. After the service. Okay. Anyone else? Wanda. Just a reminder that we are working on the craft care, and we've already got, from my understanding, we've already got five crafters who signed up to come, as well as people from the church. Yesterday I made three batches of hot pepper jelly, so I'm working on my end of it. Do we? Do we have the date? Yes, the 17th of October. It's a Sunday afternoon, and they will be coming in. It will open after our service at 11, and then uh, close at 5. So that's the plan. Um, our understanding after doing some research is that the walkabout Warren this year is the entire month of October, every Sunday. So we had to just pick one and go with it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Let us be in the spirit of giving as we give our offerings to the Lord.
We thank you, Lord, for the gift of being your children and citizens of a kingdom that has eternal value. We are grateful for the privilege of investing our time, resources, and even our very likes in which that matters to you. Preaching the gospel, pursuing justice, brokering peace, and caring for the hungry, sick, and the forgotten. We joyfully share what we have, and we ask that you would take these offerings, multiply them, and use them for your kingdom purposes. As we bring our gifts to you today, we ask you give, to give us pure hearts, rid us of pride, greed, and thanklessness. We know that all we have is yours, so give, give it back to you with joy. We give generously because we have given so generously to us. Use these gifts to make your name known throughout the world. May our gifts be a sweet, sweet fragrance to you. Amen. Our hymn of worship is My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, number 287.
Kathy would be reading the scripture this morning in my place. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. The call of wisdom. Wisdom cries out in the street, in the squares she raises her voice. At the busiest corner she cries out, at the entrance of the city gates she speaks. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will coffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you because I have called you and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when the panic strikes you, and when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, will not, will, will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel, despised all my reproof, before they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated. The simple and the complacency of fools destroys them, but those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread or disaster. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So what does the text say? God's wisdom, personified as a woman, calls out appealingly to all of us to listen and learn from her. It is to our demise to turn away our ears and hearts and lives from the ways of wisdom Personified wisdom is an important feature of Proverbs 1 through 9. Wisdom calls out to human beings everywhere they can be found. The city gates were there, the leaders of the community gathered for court cases and carried out public and private business matters. The streets, squares, and busiest corner are likely represented common meeting places of all people. Whenever we human beings gather, wisdom actively and invitingly seeks us out, calls out to us, and pours out her thoughts. Wisdom offers security and a good life, one without fear, in verse 33, to all who respond favorably to her message. But she scorns those who refuse to attend to her invitation, warning them of the consequences, which include panic, distress, calamity, and anguish. Wisdom says that she will laugh at and even mock those who have snubbed her by refusing to listen. When the time comes, it is too late to give heed, verses 26 through 28. She will no longer answer them when they call upon her. She will no longer, she will be no longer available when they seek to find her. Her indictment is devastating. They have delighted in their ridicule. They have ignored and spurned her inviting words, her counsel and reproof. The result is that they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices, verse 31. Thus, rather than, deceiving, than receiving God's blessings, they will reap what they sow.
Let us pray. Great and holy God, you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Because you are always near, we have no reason to fear, even when our world and our lives seem to be falling apart, crumbling beneath our very feet. In the midst of danger and destruction, violence and vice, malice and malady. You are our rock of faithfulness, a refuge in which we may find shelter, a port of safety from the storm, a mother's comfort from our fears and anxieties. Hide us now under your wings, cover us with your mighty hand. When the oceans rise and the thunder roars, you will soar we will soar with you above the floods, above the clouds, beyond the turmoil and chaos of this world. Will we be still and know that you are God, and in you we will find rest for our weary hearts and hope for our souls. Lord, we ask that you look upon those who are in need of your blessings. Gracious God, we ask for prayer today for this community. There are many hurts and sorrows. The sermon recalling 9-11. There are many joys and celebrations. You know them all and we are thankful. For those who are hurting, please bring great healing and peace. For those who are celebrating, we give you glory for your gifts and provisions. 
God, may these people know without a doubt that they belong to you and that they are precious in your sight. I ask that we may use our joys and sorrows as a testimony of your work in our lives. Thank you for seeing us, for hearing us, and for knowing us. In your holy name, amen. Our hymn of petition is Jesus, my Savior, pilot me. You may be seated, and please don't stand when I say the next sentence. Let us stand up together, and if we can't stand up, at least stand together. It's 20 years after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and we need to face our challenges as united Christians alongside other people of faith in a truly united States of America. Oh, I'm sorry. I see it now, top of the page. Okay. okay, sorry, Kevin. I'm goofing up bad today. I'm sorry. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I was trying to move things along. The scripture text today comes from Isaiah 50, 4 through 9a, the servant's humiliation and vindication. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know, know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and, is not, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out, my beard, pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore, I have been not, not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them comfort me. It is the Lord God who helps me. 
who declares me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Let us stand up together, and if we can't stand, at least stand together. It's 20 years after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and we need to face our challenges as united Christians alongside other people of faith in a truly united states of America. But how? Some anniversaries are joyous occasions, not this one. 20 years ago yesterday, on September 11th, Al-Qaeda terrorists overpowered our four passenger airliners. Two were flown into the towers of the World Trade Center in New York City at 8.46 a.m. and at 9.03 a.m. A third was crashed into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. And a fourth was heading toward Washington, D.C., but crashed in a Pennsylvania field at 10.03 a.m. when passengers bravely overwhelmed the terrorists. May God bless them all. Almost 3,000 people died. 25,000 were injured and many others suffer long-term health problems. 9-11 stands as the deadliest terrorist attack in recent history. As we all know, in response, the U.S. launched a war on terror and invaded Afghanistan to overthrow the Taliban. This group had been protecting al-Qaeda terrorists and refusing to hand over Osama bin Laden, who took responsibility for the attacks. After 10 long years, bin Laden was located in Pakistan and killed in a U.S. raid. So how did 9-11 affect us? The act of terrorism was like the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in that it drew Americans together in the face of a common enemy. The motto, united we stand appeared everywhere. Flags were flown, churches were packed. Muslim organizations quickly condemned the attacks and President Bush made an appearance at the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. and spoke of the valuable contributions that Muslims made to the United States every day and called for them to be treated with respect, though many refused to. Partisan differences were put aside and the government restructured itself in a number of ways, including the creation of Homeland Security. September 11, 20, 2001 was a horrible day, but it pulled America together in a beautiful way. The prophet Isaiah has words that are appropriate for this anniversary. They not only take us back to 2001, but they point us in the future and lay a challenge before us. The Lord God helps me, says Isaiah. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have not set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. These words match the attitude of our country in the days after 9-11. We turn to God for help, and we found that God upheld us. We showed unity and resolve, settling our faces like flint on the challenges of a national security and respect for our brothers and sisters. We're thankful that we weren't disgraced. The challenges of 2001 are not behind us. If anything, they are bigger than ever. So how can Christians stand together with other peoples of faith? Who will contend with me, asks Isaiah in verse 8. After 9-11, the answer was Al-Qaeda. But today, our greatest threat is domestic terrorism, the people who attacked the Capitol on January 6, 2021, who are extremists from our own country. The challenge before us, 20 years after 9-11, is to stand up together in verse 8. We need to face our challenges as United Christians alongside other people of faith in a truly United States of America. But how do we do this? 
How do we overcome our partisanism and stand together as we did after September 11th, 2001? First, we need to grasp our mission in the world. The prophet Isaiah is talking about a servant when he says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher in verse four, and exactly who is the servant teacher? Isaiah thought that Israel itself was God's servant. Later on, members of the Christian church saw Jesus as the servant in these words. In either case, a servant should be a teacher, not a master who governs. If we are all going to follow Jesus, then we need to be such servants as well. As servants of God, we are teachers of grace and truth and justice. As the golden rule states, treat others as we want to be treated and to see everyone as a child of God, made in the image and likeness of God. We should lift people up, not knock them down, help them, not hurt them, love them, not hate them. Today, it's tough enough to find people who treat each other with respect. Do you know what Osama bin Laden said soon after the 9-11 attacks? It has become clear that the West in general, and American in particular, have an unspeakable hatred for Islam. That statement was a lie, but it is an ongoing challenge for us to prove that those words remain untrue. In that we say, we need to use the tongue of a teacher that we may know how to sustain the weary without a word. That's our mission, according to Isaiah, to teach God's ways and to sustain the weary with a word, to serve a world in need, to encourage the people around us, and to develop relationships that are respectful and honest and open. Islamic extremists reach out to people who are feeling angry, vulnerable, and isolated, loners who are looking for a group. So our job is to make connections with the least of our brothers and sisters. Isaiah says that God wakens the servant's ear to listen to those who are taught, verse four, meaning that we are servants of God, have a lot of to learn by listening. Yes, that's a good thought for sure, but the translation of this line offered by the great Bible scholar Brevard Childs is even better. He wakens my ear like disciples, verse four. To listen like disciples is the challenge for each of us, isn't it? Listen to what Jesus is saying to each of us. Listen to God, what God is saying to us. Listen to what Muslims, Muslims and Jews and people of other faiths are saying to us. Listen, period. Our job is to teach and listen and learn as we grow into servants of God who are nothing less than a light to the nations. Isaiah 49, verse 6. That's our God-given mission to the world. Next, we are challenged to cooperate with God. The Lord God has opened my ear, says the servant Isaiah, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward, Isaiah 50, verse five. Our challenge is that God is trying to get us to a better future, and we need to follow God's lead. We are being rebellious, when we turn around and follow other voices. It's almost like worshiping false idols and other gods. Peter Marty, a Lutheran pastor who is concerned about preaching in a time of deep political polarization, has noticed that many worshipers are ready to assign a political motive to everything a preacher says. Preachers get into trouble for saying too much or too little about Black Lives Matter, about the Capitol invasion, and about the presidencies of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Who doesn't? We're all trying to be politically correct so we don't offend. 
In the face of these challenges, Marty tries to preach sermons that help individuals to meet God or be met by God. He tries to say things that reveal Christ's presence in the world. Yes, he certainly feels called to reflect on cultural and political events, but he tries to do so in a way that offers new insights and fresh perspectives. He has no interest in choosing partisan political positions. But there is a problem, according to Marty. Many Christians now interpret faith through the prism of their political ideology. It is true, Christians on the right and on the left, and this approach is the opposite of what Isaiah recommends. Our challenge is to let the Lord God open our ears and not rebel against God when we hear a challenging word. In a word of partisan politics, our goal should be to cooperate with God and to move forward in God's way. With God's help, if we understand our mission and cooperate with God, then we will make an amazing discovery. God will help us. The prophet Isaiah knew this, which is why he said, the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, in verse seven. In the face of any hardship, Isaiah was able to keep moving forward because the Lord was offering assistance. The God who vindicates me is near, said Isaiah. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together, verse eight. Inspirational words in the aftermath of 9-11 they can be helpful to us today. We are always stronger as a community than, uh, than we are as isolated individuals. So the challenge for us is to trust God and stand up together. After all, it takes a village. We can do this by refusing to fall victim to fear. The command, do not be afraid, along with the closely related phrase, have no fear, is one of the most repeated phrases in the Bible. It appears about 80 times throughout the Old and New Testament. This command is grounded not in wishful thinking, but in the conviction that Almighty God is willing to fight for us if we allow it. Troubled? Give it to God. God will fight for us when we are battling illness in body mind and spirit. God will help us when we are feeling lonely, overwhelmed or confused. God will assist us in the face of any difficulty and God often does this through the members of the church, the body of Christ. It is the Christian community that we are best able to stand up together. But we also take a stand for God when we build bridges in the wider community. We are dividing into hostile tribes, says retired General Jim Mattis. After four decades in the Marine Corps, Mattis knows that our internal divisiveness is often more threatening than our external enemies. Our focus should be on rediscovering our common ground and finding solutions, says Mattis. God will help us with this if we allow it. We can use this anniversary of 9-11 to grasp our mission in the world, cooperate with God, and trust God to help us. 20 years ago, the motto, United We Stand. But now, more than ever, is the time to stand up together. Our hymn of benediction is, I Come With Joy.
sending forth, life is too short and too hard to try to make it alone. God will never ever forsake us or leave us. Brothers and sisters of faith, on whom we can fully rely when times get tough. So let us go forth as people of faith who know who the help their homes. Amen.